All right, man. We got Higher Human episode number four. Okay. We've done three. And I have uh, a really cool guest, a special guest, Jacob Hayward, who has been a, a client of mine, a friend of mine over the last probably year. All right. We've been grinding from uh, or through a kind of a weird off season with, weird. with, with COVID. Super weird. But this guy is, is um, just a, a special human. And him and I have had the opportunity to share and connect, and I just figured he was a, a great guest for this because he has taught me a lot about being a better human and, and opening my mind to all kinds of stuff. So I'm excited for the conversation, man. I appreciate you being here and, uh, you know, taking time out of your Sunday. Yeah, no, I appreciate you, B. You know, I'm definitely, you know, blessed to be here, man. Blessed to be around you, blessed to be around your presence. And um, this is just a, a joy for me, man. Just, you know, I was really you know, nervous about this at first. And then, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I've, you know, been around you and in your presence, man, it's just, it's more excitement now than nervousness. So I'm definitely ready to get it going. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think when I think of you, I, I think of, I think of love. I think of a, a big heart. And we were talking right before and you said, man, if you, if you lead with love, if you open your heart to things, it's really hard to go wrong. Yeah. And I think that's, to me, higher human is, a, that's what that's about, right? It's, it's a piece of it is performance because that's a passion of mine. Um, but within that, there is human connection and um, openness mm -hmm. to learn and, and really embracing a growth way of living. Right. So, so that's what really this is about. And that's how I see you, man. So, yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. I, I'm all about love. I'm all about um, spreading love and I think that's what this world lives off of really yeah you know, love and hate and I feel like that's just kind of a balance that's hard to deal with and hard to hard to see sometimes you know in this world we get distracted by a lot of things but I think if we can all focus on love I think that's that's the way to move yeah so tell me tell me a little bit more about yourself I mean I know I know a lot about mm -hmm. you but we'll, we'll tell the people kind of your right. story as a you know, where you grew up and as a baseball player, what you're doing now. All right, so um, I grew up in uh, McDonough, Georgia, um, born and raised since from baby to high school. Um, went to University of Miami um, after, in 2014 to, from 2014 to 2016. Um, went there for three years. Got drafted by the Giants, San Francisco Giants in the 18th round. And I've been playing ever since. I'm still with the Giants now. I've been there for what I think this is my gonna be my sixth year coming in, and um, I love the game. I love the grind. I love the work. Um, I'm passionate about it. I love the people, really, to be honest with you. I love you know getting to know different people, different backgrounds, and experiencing different things in life. So it's definitely been a blessing to me for sure. Tell tell everybody and even myself. Um, a little bit more about kind of being drafted mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people, I think the casual, the casual fan or the fan, I think just assumes that as a professional athlete, you get, you get drafted and, and there you go, you know, you make a bunch yeah. of money and, and right. that's what people think right. all of the situations are like, but, but it's not like a lot of times, you know, you're fighting, mm -hmm. you're fighting for a position, you're grinding. Right. So what is that? What was that like for you getting drafted and going from being a collegiate player, right. collegiate athlete to then a pro? All right, so, I mean, I was drafted, technically I was drafted twice. I was drafted, um... Can you I, the, the mic a little closer? Closer to me? Cool. Yeah, a little bit. Is that cool? Yeah, that's good. Yes. You too, a little bit, Brent. Just okay. a little bit. Okay. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I was uh, drafted twice. My first time was 2013 out of high school by the Braves. Um, and my family and I kind of made the decision that, you know, I need to kind of grow up a little bit and, and go see the world, you know, and, and kind of grow up as a man. Um, the draft process then was kind of different because, you know, I wanted to put my, myself in the best position to succeed. And we felt like at that time, that point in time, um, it just wasn't the best thing for me. Um, getting drafted out of college is a different story because, you know, you have the battles of competing at a college at a, at a top, top five school in the country baseball wise. Um, the focus is there um, as players, as, as a team, um, your coaches are trying to push you to be the best version of you every single day. Um, and I guess the draft process then was more of a, I want to get out really. And 
hmm. get, get out of. I wanted to get out of college. Yeah, I wanted to, ready. you know, I wanted to give myself, you know, a chance. You know, I, I think I grew up a lot, a lot quicker than than most people really, um, through the struggles of college and and, and dealing with certain stuff. But um, no, um, the draft process, I think, is different, man. Like you know, you get drafted. I guess maybe it's different for me because I see my brother go through it already. Um, and I see him get drafted in 07 to what, three years uh, in the minor leagues and then getting to the big leagues pretty fast. And that's not normal, right? right? And I think, you know, some people can view it like that, can view it as, oh, you see this guy get drafted. Oh, hey, yeah, he's going to be in the big leagues next year or he's, he's going to get this big contract now, right? And it's really not like that for most people in this sport. You know, most people, most players in this sport, um, don't really get paid a lot starting off. So I think it's a it's a big, big step for people or for players to really understand that this is a business, one. And two, if this is something that you really want to do, you got to go all in. And it's just a six-month six month out of the year season. And then on top of that, your off season is, is also, it's the same thing as work. It's, it's 12 months, 12 months nonstop working in. Um, yeah, it's that. Yeah. What what was it like growing up in Georgia? And and then what what's that's transition from right. that into Miami? Cuz yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that's a pretty that's a pretty big Bro. culture shock, Bro. different, right? Huge, man. So, you know, from somebody that I've never been in the south. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been to Florida. Right. I've been to Tennessee. Mhm. That's it. Right. So most of my life is here. Right. What's what's it what's that like? You know, walk me through that a bit. Man, Georgia is um, one of a kind. It's the South. Um, it's um, it's home for me. Yeah. You know that's that's where I was raised. Um, my dad is from South Carolina. He's from the South. My mom's from New York. So I mean, imagine the difference how my mom felt. You know, moving down and, and, and raising two kids in Georgia. So the city. Like yeah, New York she's city from or? she's from Queens. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Jamaica yeah. Queens. So yeah. she's man. She's uh. It was brand new to her, but now, you know, now she loves it. She yeah. loves being in Atlanta. She loves uh, the culture. She loves um, going to her plays and all that stuff in the city. So, but it's cool. But no, growing up in Georgia, man, <clears throat> I would say <clears throat> as a kid, it was it was a good experience. It's a fun experience. You know, you get to play outdoors. You, you know, everybody plays sports. Sports, is, sports in the South is huge, yeah. right? Like football is like almost like religion to people down there. And and I kind of realized that once I got out of Georgia, because you know people don't people around in this country, every or different regions of the country don't feel the same way about every single sport. You know, most regular regular people who have regular everyday jobs don't look at sports the same way. But in in the South where I'm from, sports is damn near your life. Yeah. And um, I think the culture of that really shaped shaped me to shaped me into the person that I am today a little bit but also help me, you know, look at myself in the mirror and realize, you know, there's more more out there than just sports. Um, and then I guess transitioning that into going to Miami, like, you know, <laughs> it's a, being in Miami is not even like it's been in the United States to me. It's, um, there's so many different cultures, you know, it's the, the, the school, college was like it's international. You have people from Spain, France, um, all, over the, all over the globe. And I think, you know, my first, I think my first month in college, I had to stay on campus, or my, yeah, I had, so I had to stay on campus the first year as, as a freshman, and it was so abnormal to me. Like, I, I felt almost uncomfortable to a certain extent, you know, going to, driving around the city, and uh, the signs are in Spanish, you know, and, and you know, the, the Cuban, uh, the Cuban culture is really a big staple in, in that community down there, right? And coming up to people who don't even speak English to you and, and catching that vibe, it was definitely different. But it also, you know, made me almost open myself up to the to me and being myself even more, being showing my culture, showing where I come from, being from the South, right? And showing my, my love for uh music, my love for um my love for baseball, my love for any every kind of sport. Because, you know, in uh I guess Cuban culture to a certain extent it's more of a I would say it's more um baseball dominant right baseball is like king yeah there so um but for me i think miami was just huge like it was being around that shaped me today and it also you know it made me look at people differently you know because you know 
especially growing up in the South, man, all you see is stuff on TV that um, is different than where you're from. Like being in the South, you know, you see mostly, it's mostly, from, or at least from where I'm from, it's mostly, you know, black and, and white kids going to school together and, and you, that's the only culture that you really see. Um, and then you, you look at the TV and you see maybe like a, a Hispanic person from the West Coast and then you have, then that kind of, you know, programs you to think a certain way about that. And going to Miami changed all that, right? Like it, it made me, you know, really understand these people. And it was a blessing to me because those people reminded me of my family. They treated me like family. And I feel like the love that I have for the people in Miami is never, ever going to leave me for sure. Right. Where is University of Miami? Is it in the city? Is it is it on the coast? I, I don't know. So it's, it's in Coral Gables. It's, the funny thing is you know, Coral Gables is like literally five minutes well, with traffic off the 101 or or whatever the, the road is there, the main highway is there, but it's like five, ten minutes from Brickell, which is um, not South Beach, but it's kind of the main, kind of the main drag um, for the people of Miami, I would say. Um, it's kind of like a little version of Scottsdale, but just more obviously by the water. Um, yeah. That's really cool. Um, but Coral Gables is more of a close-knit community, um, kind of like a suburb, I guess you would say, and the people there are, are awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Is is the university big? Is it a dude? No. Is it pretty small? It's small. Yeah. Like I, I remember when I, cause when I, the funny thing is, I committed without even uh, visiting the school, and I don't really think I had any expectations of what the campus was gonna look like, right? But when I went there and compared it to like a UCLA or uh, a University of Georgia or something like that, the school is not as big at all. Um, it's kind of like a just like a few a few streets around it, but at the same time, it's got a got a good decent part of land, a piece of land. Um, they got a big lake in the middle of it, which is beautiful, um, next to the, uh, our student activity center. But um, yes, yeah, it's, it's not too big. So we talked about this a while ago, but and I felt like this kind of segues into this. But you talked about um, choosing the difficult path, mm -hmm. and that we kind of went into Georgia Tech and, right. and at the time, right. you know, I think how you expressed it was that for you, that was kind of making your own path. Mm -hmm. um, you, I mean, can we, can we touch on that no, a little for, bit? Because I mean, sure. I think that's, yeah. that's something that I was fascinated. I feel like you always drop these, these bombs on me. And I'm like, <laughs> man, I never really thought about that. Because yeah. I tend to probably be preachy about, preachy from a good place mm -hmm. about uh, accepting struggle right and embracing it right because i do think that's when we grow mm -hmm. when we can allow ourselves to uh, accept struggle and see it and, and kind of kind of choose to go that way right. like i'm a big i'm a big fan of i don't know who first said this but you know as a coach is a coach can can show you the door mm -hmm. but the student has to choose to walk through you know sure. that kind of thing yeah. but i want to hit on that man you know kind of walk me through that yeah, so, I mean, I think we talked about this it was last week or this week. Where I can't remember working out, but, um, yeah, so it was – I looked at it as choosing Miami was – me going, me choosing Miami out of high school was more of a decision that I felt that I needed to – not even that I needed to, but more that I wanted to get away. I wanted to grow up. I wanted to, 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 to be a man to a certain extent, right? It's, 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 be a man, as right. people say, right? But – I wanted to experience things on my own for myself and have my own thoughts and not kind of st stick around with the same crowd that I grew up with because I felt like, you know, certain people around me weren't really going anywhere. And I didn't want to be like everybody else. I've always wanted to do different things. I didn't want to, you know, fit the mold of just going here and making the decision and staying in the same pocket just because I feel comfortable. I almost kind of wanted to be uncomfortable to a certain extent, right? Um, and I guess when I told you about the struggle, like, I think, I think my life or my career could have been differently if I would have went to Georgia Tech. Um, I do, I think the opportunities there in terms of, you know, understanding, understanding the game, the politics of, of sports, of college sports, you know, and understanding the, the politics of college sports and realizing, you know, the relationships that I had with Georgia Tech, the coaches that I that I that I had got to know there as a child, right? I'd been going to those camps since I was little, and them knowing me, maybe that could have 
hmm. gave me a little bit more opportunity to succeed on the field, right. a little bit more playing time, I guess, you know, for athletes out there to say. Um, and and not to, you know, shut down Miami or anything, because that's, that's my family. I, I love them. I love them like it's my second family, right? But I do believe in terms of my career path, in terms of, you know, me wanting to do this as a job and, and trying to make money to provide for myself and my family for, moving forward, I think Georgia Tech could have been a better option. But at the same time, you know, I'm looking back and I'm looking back at that and saying, I don't think I'd be the person I am today without going to Miami. Right. Um, they shaped me and they, they helped grow me, right? And I wouldn't even say it's about struggle. I think it's about, you know, I think it's about loving something that you haven't loved before. I think it's about um, putting yourself in, in places that make you uncomfortable, knowing that your end goal is to be the best version of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Miami definitely put me in that position. But <laughs> I just want to say this one more time. For anybody, for any kid, you know, listening or whatever, I think at that point in time, um, you're going to college. If you're going to college for baseball, just for baseball, whatever sports you play, you have to be make sure make sure that you're putting yourself in a position to be able to go to the next level, to be able to um, be on the field. It doesn't matter really what school you play at. I don't believe if your talent is there and you're competing at a high level, it's going to show. Right. And that's what I think is really the main goal for, or the, the main focus on in that situation. You know, I got to put myself. For moving forward, I want to put myself in positions that's going to make me succeed and not leave it into anybody else's hands, really. Mm. So, yeah. So there's this kind of this weird paradox between uh, choosing the path that's that might be harder because we feel like it's going to make us a man yeah. or it's going to make us stronger mm -hmm. and almost feeling guilty about taking the easy route right. because that's kind of been conditioned into mm -hmm. us, right? But sometimes easy, the easy route might not be the wrong route exactly because we can still put all we have into that, right? That, yes. I mean, that's kind of the gist, that's, is it? De that's definitely, I mean, that's definitely it, because I feel like, um, you know, we can't, we can't make life harder than what it is, because life is the hardest thing in the world, right? Like, there's going to be ups and downs, but, you know, as many times as you can be up, or as many times as you're going to be down, you're going to want to be up more, yeah. than, more than being down, so. Yeah. Um, and what you just said was just 100% true. Like, you know, if there's something, I think, I think we... As men, you know, we do that to ourselves sometimes. We try to say, ah, just let me deal with this adversity and not, you know, make it easier on myself because I know that something later on in life is going to come at me again that, that's going to be hard and I need to be able to know how to react to that. No. Like, we're never, ever going to be able to, you know, understand or see the future or see what, 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 what's going to be in front of us that's going to, that's going to make it harder for us to, to live our lives, right? And... That's the thing. Everything is unknown. So I would just say, you know, put yourself in a position for yourself to succeed. If it's the easy way or if <laughs> whatever the easy way may be to you or if whatever somebody else says is the easy way, but it's also beneficial to your career and your life and your family, whatever it may be, then you take that. I don't I don't believe that I need to force myself to put myself in, 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 a, in a bad situation or in a tougher situation that's gonna, to a certain extent, limit my growth as a, as a player. Right. I gotta put myself in situations to help me move forward. Right. I find myself thinking, um, you know, a little bit with training hmm. and how there is a belief that you gotta grind, mm -hmm. right? There's a belief that getting up at 4 a.m. is, is <laughs> the right, it's tough, right? right? Like I can do it. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because there's a time and a place for that, mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with getting rest or recovering. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think we're starting to see shift in my, in my space as right. a coach is athletes understanding that, that it's okay to take a day off or it's right. okay to recover. And that, that doesn't mean you're less tough. Mm -hmm. It actually, in a lot of ways, probably means you're smarter. Right. But it's kind of a similar thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we think, we think we're kind of, again, we've been programmed to think mm -hmm. that the grinder that gets up at 4 a.m. every day and that fights through things is yeah. the guy that's successful. And not to say that that's not powerful, mm -hmm. but 
you don't have to do that to be successful. And I think that's that's kind of the gist is that choosing the choosing the hardest path just because it's hard right. or because we feel like uh, we have to do it to to grow or to become a man or mm-hmm. a woman right. isn't necessarily the, probably the, the most intelligent way to look at it. You know? oh, dude, yeah. I, that's 100% correct. You know, <laughs> our mind is the strongest thing in our body to me, right? And, you know, all the knowledge that, that people have uh, calculated over the years and, and brought into sports, all the science that they bring into sports, and that you're you're very, very knowledgeable on stuff like that, right? More knowledgeable than I am. But all that stuff comes into place. Your sleep comes into place. Um, your rest, the treatment that you that you do to your body could be um, a better better thing for you. And, and what I've noticed is, you know, it's not about getting up early in the morning. It's about you putting the love that you have into what you do. It's really about your happiness. I feel like, you know, I, I've noticed at least, and it, and it, and it can be different from, it's definitely different for uh, other people. I'm not, I'm not trying to say everybody's like this, but at least from my experience, I feel like whenever I'm in my happiest place, that's when I'm at, at the best in my work. Right. You know, like whenever my mind is, you know, clear, I, I have peace in my heart. I feel like that's the best time that I, I can work and focus on what I need to do or whatever lift I'm doing that day or, you know, and I don't think it's about, I definitely don't think it's about waking up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning. That's that's movie stuff. <laughs> right. You know, I, I, that's the Rocky Balboa exactly, life. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. And it's like unless you have to. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess if it's if you have to. Oh, a hundred percent. I you know, like college, college, we would have to do our runnings in the off season at six o'clock in the morning, and you know, some people might be frustrated, but I, don't, I mean, that's just a part of college one because you have to go run, lift, class practice there's not there's not enough time in the day to say oh i'm just going to lift here and do this running in the middle of the day or even in in, in miami it makes sense too because uh if I, we're going to run we're not going to run at freaking one o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's at its highest and it's 93 degrees and you're sweating sweating your eyes off so okay. yeah, it's, yeah it wouldn't make sense yeah um so we'll change gears a little bit right but i found myself thinking thinking this so you know, I think you you'd be a great father, be a great coach someday. Where you know you're young enough, you got plenty so of time. Too, but, right, yeah, right. Yeah. But let's say you're let's say you have a son, mm-hmm. and your son is uh, a gifted baseball player. Mm-hmm. Um, would you advise your son to go to college? Would you advise? Your, but and we can create different scenarios, mm-hmm. right? Because right. you know your brother went straight, you went to college. There's benefits, and I'm sure both ways. All right. So let, let's say this. Let's say your son is, is uh, you know, very gifted um, academically. He's mm-hmm. intelligent. He's a great baseball player. And let's say he's predicted to go fourth round. Mm-hmm. So that's still good money. But he's got full rides academically. Mm-hmm. Do you advi- How do you advise? And you can kind of create different scenarios there. Yeah, man. I, that's, it's, that's a tough question. Um, for him solely just talking about baseball I think or for him and not worrying about if I was the parent the situation of you know um, having to take care of him having to watch over him um, I think I would probably I would probably tell him to go to college Yeah. because I mean if I mean let's say this so if he if he's not if he's going to college for free um, I would say go and enjoy your life um, and experience different things. Now, but now if I'm looking at the baseball side of it, if I know that he's going to have a chance to play right away and not, you know, go through the the politics of, of college sports, then I, I would say he should. I, I, would, I would say... I would say go go play because you're gonna get you're gonna get your opportunities and it's gonna help you grow as a player. You're gonna understand team. You're gonna understand. Um, you, you're gonna you're gonna kind of get structure. Like when I went to college, they really helped me learn structure. How to how to how to make create a plan for myself to get for when I get to pro ball. How to do the early work. How to work hard after practice. Um, learning certain drills because in, in professional baseball, you know, to a certain extent, there's 
especially as a, for, at least for me as an outfielder, the drills in college aren't the same, aren't the same compared to to, to pro pro ball. And I'm saying that in the sense that college college outfield drills were probably better for me than professional baseball. And I think professional baseball is just a more of you're on your own, and you know there's not a there's not really hands on um, adults who are just trying to mold you into a man. It's more about, you know, what can you do on the baseball field to a certain extent, and, and that's it. Because it, at the end of the day, it is a business. You know, if, if my son's a top pick, they're going to want him to be in, in the big leagues at some point. And however that may be, it doesn't matter. If if it's two years and he's that good and he, they think he's ready to go, but his say his, his maturity level is, isn't there, and they make that decision anyways and say, we're going to put him there, they're going to put him there. But in college, you have more time to deal with the outside life, right? You, you have more time to, to, to create a real social life for yourself, for you to mature and grow up and meet, different, meet, meet new people and, and do different things. So I believe that college would be a, definitely a better space for him. And, and it's not about, and I, and I say that too, because it's not about um, your life. His life wouldn't be just about baseball, right? Like if my kid's going to go to college on an academic scholarship or whatever it may be, he's going to have a chance to change his life away from the game besides using the baseball as a sport to, to create uh, income for himself. And I think that's huge. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, th- baseball is not going to last forever. Like baseball is not going to be here for me forever. This is not my whole entire life. I have, I'm going to, li- I'm going to live, <laughs> I'm going to have more of my time away from baseball in my life than I do playing the game. Right. So as long as I can put my son or whoever, whoever it is, or he or she, or daughter, in a position to be successful after the game, then, then that's what I'm going to do. But at the same time, it's also going to be on them, because I don't ever want to tell my kids, you know, what to do. This is this is their dream, and I'm not going to get in the way of that. Yeah, yeah. No, I respect that. Um, so I went I went to ASU. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. and I remember my first day of college. It's mm-hmm. kind of funny. My parents drove me up from Tucson, and mm-hmm. we roll up and had a truck, you know, a truck full of stuff. And I remember getting there, and my my roommate, my sweet mate, is like out front of the the room, boom, mm-hmm. like with a boombox, you know, playing <laughs> right. music, ready yeah, for yeah, the party, yeah. right? <laughs> and I just remember my parents leaving, and then it's like, okay, this here we go, right. you know, I'm an adult, like mm-hmm. I I made it, right? Yeah. What was that like for you? You get you get to because I'm assuming, man, you get to Miami, and it's like Miami, like gl- you know, kind of glitzy. You know, I mean, it's like there's yeah. a completely different culture. Like, what was that like? And then what were some of the biggest adjustments culturally? You know, you kind of hit that a little bit, but even more yeah. in Miami. So I mean, it's well, I, I got to go back to to GA first too, and especially you know how my parents raised me. my parents. You know, they raised me to to use my head. Um, my dad always used to say, use your head more than, for more than a hat rack, right? <laughs> and I think being in college, you know, everybody's allowed freedom to a certain extent. But at the same time, in my mind, the way my dad raised me is to understand what I have to lose. You know, yeah. um, don't put yourself in situations that you can't get out of. Don't, don't be going to clubs when you're, when, uh, to, to clubs that are 21 years old, when you're, when you're 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. Don't put yourself in positions to get in trouble, right? Because that, things like that lead to worse, worse situations for yourself. Yeah. And I'm and and how my you know in my mindset getting into college, it was I swear to you, man, it was just about baseball. Like I really, to a certain extent, I don't even think I enjoyed the the whole college process in terms of you know partying and. Uh, going out, dry, uh, doing road trips, spring breaks, all that stuff, because baseball was such a focus for me. Um, and yeah, I, I think, and then I guess going, being being in, in Miami, just the culture part of it, <laughs> you don't, for me, I, growing up from in the South, in the small town, or not small town in Georgia, but in, in Georgia, like we're, we're not partiers, right? Like we're not, we're not um, out to the clubs in the city. I've never, I, I didn't, I wasn't a city kid. I guess anybody who's not from where, or who's, yeah, who's not from where I'm from would say I'm from the, from a country, country town. And, and going to Miami was just different. Like, so I was like, nah, I'm not going to go out to the clubs. Like, this is not what I'm going to do. And 
it just wasn't for me at the time. I felt yeah. like, yeah. Did you walk like walk or bike or drive into <sighs> town and eat? You know, I mean, you're yeah. so experienced. I'm assuming you're so experienced. So the city, right? Just in a different way. Yeah, man, def- definitely in a different way. So uh, I would say, because um, most of my, my most of my friends at the time in college were all the all my teammates. I didn't really you know social have too much of a social life with uh, the regular students there. Did you know anybody that was there? Um, or did you go there kind of solo and just, yeah, just met your teammates? There. So Yeah. I, well, I did kind of go there solo, but at the same time, I knew Dale Carey. He's from Georgia, but he was a senior my freshman year. And he kind of helped look out for me. Um, and that was that was definitely a dope experience, having him there. Because I, I think if, if he wasn't there, I don't think I, I would have went through college looking at it the same. I think I would have um, probably fought back a little bit more on certain things around that around that time. Um, but yeah, like those guys there at school, really, you know, they opened me up into their homes. Like the way those guys lived down there, it wasn't like all the guys on the team. They weren't from like downtown Miami. They're not like going to South Beach all the time. They're just suburb kids, just like me. And they more they introduced me more into like you know their uh, mom and pop shops, right? Like their uh, their their uh, Cuban food, their Cuban restaurants uh, that had croquetas. And all these and all these different types of food, right? Empanadas everywhere, right? And I think that was more of the experience that I had. It was more like a home style experience in a big city. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. I want to meet. I want to meet Papa Hay, man. Not for sure. He uh, yeah. he definitely, met, you know, and I'm sure Mama Hay too, right? right? But mm-hmm. definitely did a good job, man. Appreciate with it. you. Um, so, uh, you know, you're you're at school and and you're experiencing new culture and mm-hmm. you, you have this really cool experience and then you get you get drafted to San Francisco uh, what is that like going and showing up your first it's like low A or whatever whatever's sure. first you know because okay. that's a whole new experience right now you're on your own and right. you're competing mm-hmm. so what was that like for you and you you mm-hmm. like you said your brother went through it so mm-hmm. you probably had a, a little bit of an understanding but what um, was that like <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't think I had a under, well, the understanding that I had was really just college. Okay. Because the, the expectations there at the school I went to, Miami, was, you know, win, win, win. We're not losing. Um, so I would say, you know, that, uh, that experience, my first year I came out here to Arizona and I was in the Arizona uh, Rookie League, that was easy. Like, because... I was leaving college. I was tired of, you know, all the, the noise that, 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 that was built around that process, around that situation. And I just wanted to play the game. And coming out here to rookie ball, that's all it was, was playing the game that I love to play and not making it anything else. And, and one, thing, one thing, though, that, that also uh, helped me deal with, you know, the, the structure of professional baseball it was college was my coach teaching me the early work routine, um, the, 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 the defensive routines that I need to create, create for myself that I learned that we, he drilled into me for three years straight. And I just brought that over to pro ball and try to continue that my first year. Um, and to tell you the truth, you know, I think there was a point in time after my rookie year that I kind of got lost in everything else, all the BS around in pro ball, right? And not really on my profession and understanding that I need to grow as a baseball player. And growing means working. And working isn't just just working here on Monday and then, you know, filling it out and being ready and and doing something else on a Friday. No, it's it's about creating a routine and being consistent with that routine because it's not if I had a good week two weeks from now. It's about can I have a good month a year from now when I'm 21 or 23, 24 years old, uh, a great month in uh, April and in, in May to put myself to the big leagues, right? You got to kind of plan, you got to set a structure for yourself to be good down the line. It's like, it's like eating, it's like eating healthy for me. Like I didn't just start eating healthy for real, for real till this past off season because my, my brother and his wife, they, you know, they, they kind of pushed that on me. And I don't think, you know, people really understand, you know, why we eat healthy as, as young adults because, or, as, as, or as a young athlete, right, 25 years old, not 
that young, but a young athlete. It's, it's more about me being able to play when I'm 35 because at least for my dream, I didn't want to be, you know, 25, 26 year old just getting to the big leagues, right? And then thinking the way the game is now, thinking, you know, be out of the league at 32. So that's about, what, seven years? I want to, have, I want to be able to get 10 years in the league, you know, get, get a pension one day, set my family up straight. So I need to be for, in the, the healthy food part about, about that is because I need to be, it, it creates uh, longevity for myself. The, the cleaner my body is earlier, I think it's going to last me a longer time. Yeah, for sure, man. No, I mean, that's a, that's obviously a, a, a big, a big piece of my life is mm-hmm. embracing being healthy. And I think, I think it's the sooner you can start to embrace that. I do think it trickles down. Yeah. I think like it just starts to get everything your system just to gets better and better. Yeah. So what would be, let's dive into that because I think that's real valuable. Okay. It's like, what, what, what made you, so your brother, mm-hmm. okay, he's encouraging you, but like, so right now, how do you stick to it? Like if you have a, you have a craving to go eat something crappy, mm-hmm. do you, do you remind yourself that, all right, you know, hey, this is, this doesn't fit into right. my goal. Mm-hmm. How do you go through that process? And nobody's perfect, <clears throat> but you right. know, like, how do you stick with it and, and, um, yeah, so I mean, it's definitely hard. You know, it was definitely hard at first. I think anything that you, anything new that you're going to create a routine, especially when eating, is going to be hard. Um, I think the first few weeks it was difficult. I had to find, you know, healthy snacks, bananas, apples, um, some kind of crack, crackers, um, and and find that to eat in between the meals because, you know, as, as a young kid, we can eat at twelve o'clock at night, one o'clock in one o'clock in the morning, and then just have a bunch of trash meals throughout the day. And I think adapting to that was the hardest thing, but just like anything you do, the more you do it, the more it becomes routine, the more it becomes normal for yourself. Right. And I think like after like three, three weeks into doing the meals, like it just become natural. It became natural to me. I was eating my two meals a day. I didn't have to, I didn't wake up hungry. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't stressing to, you know, get this big, Go, or to go at Chick Fil A and drive and get the the, fav, the my favorite uh, biscuit in the morning, because I created a routine and I stuck to it and I knew that at the end of the day, that it was going to be the best thing for me, and of course, on the weekends I, I'm, I'm bro I'm killing food bro like I'm, I'm I'm killing my wings I'm in Atlanta killing my wings out here I'm, I'm ordering oreganos on the weekend everything so there's, there's a balance bro there's definitely a balance yeah. man i'm not hey I, I ain't I, I don't know what tom brady and lebron are doing but that, I, I don't know if i can do all that but you still got no, no avocado bro, uh, whatever he no avocado uh tequila or something no, hey 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 i'll do it but but at the same time you know it's all about your happiness too right because if, if you're not happy doing what you what you're doing then maybe you should think about doing something else right yeah. and, and i think that's that's really it you know if, if it's something that you want to do do it but yeah. if it's not you you can't you're not going to force yourself unless unless you're in a situation where you know you need that you need that money and you got to you got to do something to change your life right yeah. so right yeah well, got to be authentic mm. uh, for me one of the big steps that i made was i tracked my sleep mm. and i've done that for a while and as i started to pay attention to my sleep and i think you have to be careful with data mm-hmm. i think people can become obsessed with data right. But I think if you can use the some objective data and look to link it with your subjective experience mm-hmm. as, a, as an athlete or as a, a person that's somewhat tapped in and tuned yeah. into their body, I think that's the key. And for me, when I started to pay attention to my sleep, I started to realize, man, if I eat, if I eat late at night or if I eat sugar and mm-hmm. I get that huge insulin spike and, and that, that crash, it affects my sleep. And yeah. for me, trying to optimize myself and really really that plays into happiness. I feel better. Mm-hmm. I feel better if I sleep well. So that was big for me yeah, is realizing sure. how a better diet helps me sleep better and recover and mm. then ultimately do my job better. Right. No, that's real. I, I guess almost for me, it's like, um, I think it, for me at least, I think it just creates a good structure for myself. Like I don't even know, you know, I don't know the, 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 chemicals whatever it is that 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 make me feel that way right but i think it's just a good structure for my mind to know that i'm doing something positive yeah. for myself and it's really just you know it's at the end of the day it's really just loving yourself right because you're you're gonna 
you're going to want to do what's best for your body. I'm not trying to go out here and, and, and take these, uh, these, uh, supplements that are just going to, you know, change my body and, and try to make me this, this big bulky guy, whatever it is. No, I just want to live my life and, and experience it and, and love myself. And that is what I think at the end of the day, this health thing is for me. It's loving myself because I do love baseball. I do want to play this longer. So I'm giving myself a chance. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, what were some of the, let, let's transition a bit into some growth stuff and, mm-hmm. and specifically I'll say like during the lockdown, during the quarantine, right. what were some things that you, I mean, we're still, we're still in it, mm-hmm. you know, we're not, we're not, we're not through it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and not to get too heavy with right. talk about, you know, politics of it or, right. or anything like that, but just going through the quarantine and the lockdown, what are some takeaways that you have as a human? Mm get outside yeah you know get outside get that uh get, get that sun on you yeah um obviously it was it was super hard you know to be around people because you know the fear of yeah. everybody you know transmitting the virus right um but get outside um read books um don't just stick just keep your head on into the tv you know try to do different things find a hobby like for myself, it was hard as a baseball player because I'm so, I was so just, you know, baseball, baseball, baseball. I didn't know how to adjust to not playing baseball. Right. To not, you know, my focus wasn't on, you know, going, getting get into spring training because we had just left there. And it's like, you know, the unknown is, is wild. Um, but I think, you know, we got to create, for at least for myself or as athletes, right? It's, we got to create, um, other things outside of our sport that make it or find other things outside of our sport that make us happy. Um, like I, I, I picked up a uh, photography. I picked up, I, I got a camera now and that is something that I really love to do. And I've always felt like I had an eye for it. Right. But I never took the time out of my day to go do that for myself. And we get, and, and what I noticed was, you know, especially during the, during the quarantine time, like I was just, you know, self-reflecting and realizing, you know, I wasn't really doing anything for myself to a certain extent, right? Like right. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, um, I'm doing everything you know that that somebody else wants me to do, to a certain extent, and I got to take time out of the day to, to do things that I actually love to do because it's just there and it can and I can do it. Not that it's um, a stressor. It's just a relaxer. Like it's just calm, taking pictures. <clears throat> looking at looking at a, a a tree, looking at the birds flying, like that's like to me, it's just peaceful. Like I learned that you know peace is a big part of me, and that that's what I need, right? Like mm-hmm. I think that's what every human being needs, and you know, experiencing that quarantine, that's that's what I took out of it. Just trying to find peace in different little things, and the, like there's a bookshelf over there. There's there's things that <clears throat> there that are in books that you know especially my generation, maybe, or maybe the younger generation, that everybody sees. There, there's things in this world that we haven't either seen or talked about that we don't even, we can't even fathom because we haven't uh, heard about it. And it's like, go dive into something that you don't know about. Mm. Go learn something new. Um, uh, don't embrace, you know, the struggle to, in, 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 that, in that sense. Like, don't, don't think, oh, yeah, you got the virus, da da da. I'm just gonna stay in and not do anything, right? I'm no. Go find something to create yourself to to uh, for yourself to have fun to, to to love, because if you're not if you're sitting there, you know, not giving any love out, then that's just not good for anybody. It's not good for yourself. Yeah. I mean, when you're not giving love out, you're really not giving it to yourself either, mm-hmm. because that's that's really what it really what life's about to me. Yeah, man. I I think I'm a big believer in you have to. If you want to change other people, you got to change yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think a big piece of that is understanding your passion, understanding your purpose, um, probably having enough love for yourself mm-hmm. to give yourself that time to slow down. Yeah, I think that's that. That's probably not even a generational thing. I mm-hmm. think it's a, it probably Everybody. happens. Yeah, it happens in different ways. Mm-hmm. But I definitely find that a battle that I still fight is allowing myself time to slow down and to do the things I love outside of me. I, I love my work. I love working with people, but I find there's a, there's pressure to always be moving forward with something like to be productive. Mm-hmm. 
and I think I'm learning how to slow down and accept that, right? And for me, meditation has done that, mm. but it might be, it might be a run, it might be a bike ride, it might be a hike. A lot of times it's reading right. that I'm, I'm aware that I can read something with the intent of experience it, experiencing it and embracing it and learning rather than mm-hmm. reading something to get through it, mm-hmm. right? Like feeling like I need to rush through this chapter. Like I'm going to look ahead and I got 25 pages in this right. chapter. I got, you know, mm-hmm. I, think, I think that's a big lesson is just to, to, to be okay slowing down right. and to give yourself that time yeah. to have compassion and love for yourself to say, hey, you know, I'm going to be I'm going to be productive. I, I'm going to do all these things and I can slow down a little bit. And probably slowing down is also a piece of being productive, right. if that makes sense. It definitely does. Definitely um, does. I, I think that's, that kind of goes hand in hand with, with the working out. You don't have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning every single day. Right. You need to slow down, get your rest, make sure you're getting enough enough sleep. Yeah. And then you get your workout in, wherever, whenever, whatever time it may be. Because if you're not sleeping, then you're not going to have a good workout. Yeah. Or you might. You could have a good workout this one day, but you're not going to be consistent. Yeah. So it's like, man, like, you, when you really look at it, like, are you really doing what's best for you? Are you really, you're, are you really, is it really good for you to just create this stress that's not really there? Right. You know, it's, it's really a myth that, that, you know, we're, we're taught to a certain extent. Right. right. That, oh, we need to, it, mean, it means something that you get up early in the morning. What the hell does that mean? Right. Well, you can, you get up you get up before so you can post it on Instagram. Man, what? Like, dude. You know, look at me. I mean, and right. that's kind of the world we live in, it unfortunately. Is, sure. is, yeah. I, and I think that's a I, I struggle with that still is this balance between, um, you know, showing what I what I do and what I believe in as a way to help people, but then also feeling like, um, mm. you know, do I really need to be putting this stuff out there? Like, it's it's a yeah. it's an interesting balance, yeah. you know. I remember reading something or, or, or hearing something about, it's probably specific to social media, it's like highlight your practice rather than practice to highlight. Mm. So, so like in the fitness space where it's like, I'm going to go to the gym today to take a video of me doing this so I look good right. versus this is what I believe in. This is what I do because I, because I have passion for it, I, there's a purpose, and mm-hmm. I believe in feeling good and all of these things, and then just highlight that. Mm-hmm. You know, those are two different things, right? right? But that's it. It's, <clears throat> it's challenging sometimes, you know? That's, that's wild. I, I've, I've even kind of like, looked at my social media now, especially since we haven't played since, I haven't played an official game since 2019, and now it's like my social media account is more, it's just my life. Like, yeah. It's my experience, right? Like, I, but when I was playing, you would see pictures of me playing baseball. Like, my, my feed used to be just straight me pictures of me playing baseball, and it was like, damn, like, you know, seeing certain things now, seeing how my life has changed now, seeing where I've been just in in this past year and a half, I've experienced different things, so I can put different things out there. Yeah, um, I, I'm also kind of a private person, you know that. Um, I can't, I don't put everything out there, but whenever I do put anything out there, it's I think it's, a, it's I, I put it out of love, I put it out of respect for whoever I'm supporting, and it has to be positive. All right. I'm not going to go and put something out there that's negative. I'm not going to go out here and attack somebody. All I want to do is just, you know, promote positivity and you being yourself. Because I think, you know, the more people can get that, the better off this world is. Yeah. So, yeah. You said, you know, you said find things that you, you enjoy, you know, in photography for you. Mm-hmm. And I, I find myself thinking that if you can find things and find people that pull you into the moment, I think that's a, that's a key component of happiness. Mm. And I think it's something that I've learned as I've gotten a little bit older is that the people that, the people that I, I truly appreciate are people that pull me into the moment. And that can be, I think that's a, that's a, an element of love. Mm-hmm. And I think it can be very different. You know, it can be you and I's conversation. All right. And you're, you'll, you'll say something that man, makes me think differently. That's right. that you're pulling me into the moment. Mm-hmm. And I think a passion like photography, that's pulling you into the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Sport yeah. pulls you into the moment. Right. And, um, uh, a, a, you know, a really good partner, you know, a, a, someone that you're going to, 
you know, spend a lot of time with, maybe mm-hmm. even the rest of your life. Right. Like that to me, something I've, I've realized now is, at least for me, that person, I want them to pull me in. And, um, you know, I've been able to experience that, yeah. is that it's, it's when, you, when you have a good connection with somebody, I think they pull you into moments easier. Mm. And I think that's a huge piece of life. <laughs> that's dope. You know? Yeah, that's dope. I never, that's crazy. I, I never looked at it like that. I really, I, I don't think I've ever looked at it like that. Yeah. Um, that is, well, that's real. Like, yeah. You know, especially, you know, looking at different connections that you have with, it could be a relationship or, or your friends, you know, anybody, just like you're saying, anybody who puts you in the moment and, and keeps you, and pulls you into the moment and, you know, has you there and not, you know, everything else is just nothing. Yeah. It's like, that's amazing. Right. Like, that's just dope. I don't, I don't even got nothing to say. You, you got that <laughs> one, bro. You got that one. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I had to go through stuff to get there, to get yeah. to that realization. Maybe I had to grow myself. Mm. Um, but now I do, when I'm in those moments, I find myself, I'm aware if I'm being pulled away or mm. if my brain, if I'm thinking right. too much yeah, yeah. and because of this, this authentic authenticity of a person, mm-hmm. it makes me want to tap in. All right. So like that, again, I could say the same thing with you in a conversation. Like if, if I, if I'm having a conversation with you when you're making a point, I'm like, man, that's pretty profound. Mm. I'll catch myself being like, be here, yeah, like, right. be here now yeah. to try to embrace this and accept it and hear it and understand it. And I think, I think as people, man, that's, that's what we should, we should see people, right? All right. And when I say that, like seeing people, I think love and understanding are very synonymous. Mm-hmm. Like, like if you are really going to love somebody, I think you have to understand them. And the only way you understand them is to, to truly see them. Right. And for me, seeing them is this, what does that even mean? And just like you're tapping into the moment. Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> to me, it's, it's definitely like communication is huge. Yeah. Um, the dialogue is huge, you know. Um, I think it's hard for people to, it's hard for people who have been through, you know, tough things to just open up to everybody. Right. And to, right. a, to accept love, too, right? Like, you know, it, of course you want to spread it, but it's hard to, for people to, to accept true, genuine love from people. Yeah. Um, just because of whatever their past experiences have brought to them. And I think as long as, you know, you can create a good dialogue with somebody, then you can get to that point that you're talking about. It might take a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'll say this, though, at the same time, you still need to protect your energy, right? Like, I'm not just going to, you know... Yeah. put myself out there and, and put my love and respect out there for somebody who's not going to, um, who's just going to keep shooting it down. And, and I'm not talking about like relationships with, uh, with, with, uh, with another person in terms of like having a girlfriend or whatever it is. I'm talking about any, any human being, if they're just going to keep shooting it down and, and, and keep bringing, trying to, and, and throwing negative, negative, neg- negativity back to the love that I'm given, like there's no reason to me to deal with it. Right. So yeah, you gotta close that, bro. Because it, it's like a battery, man. Bro, some people, yeah. some people drain you. Some people charge Dude, you up. One hundred percent. Like it's not, it's not worth it, man. Yeah. Like you know, and and for me, man, it used to be hard for me to deal with stuff like that because I cared, you know, about people a lot more than I even realized myself, right? But like, I really cared about people. I really cared, you know, what people thought. Yeah. And that what they think does not matter, mm-hmm. you know. We're all living, we're all living um, in our own space, and all I can do is give my love to that space, mm-hmm. and then have it have the love come back to me, and that's all I want to do. And whenever I see anything that's you know stopping me, or any relationship that I have with anybody that's stopping me or putting me in a space that I feel like I can't give that love out. Or even give it to myself, or give the, give me the respect that I that I deserve, then I just got to walk away from it mm-hmm. and stick to what I know, and but can keep. But at the same time, when I walk away, I'm not gonna walk away and be frustrated at the person, because obviously they haven't done anything for me. So why should I care? If you haven't done anything for me in terms of you know respect and love, then I don't need to trip about it because I'm all about love and that's what I focus on. Mm-hmm. It's just the next thing. How do you feel like you got to that place? How did you come to that realization? 
because I do think that's really valuable. I, I mm-hmm. think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think you and I are probably pretty similar mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and I don't think I was able, I think I let, I let a lot of people um, affect me mm-hmm. because I felt like, I felt like I could change them yeah. or I felt like I wanted to help them. Right. And at some point, you know, you can't help everybody. Mm-hmm. Like at some point, again, I think the best way to help other people is through yourself. Mm-hmm. And then they've got to make, they've got to make those decisions. But I don't know if I've really realized that until, shoot, maybe the last year, right. you know, so, and, and I really started to see like, man, so there's certain relationships that people that I love, mm-hmm. but I just don't, we're not on the same wavelength. Mm-hmm. We're not living in the same space and it's okay to walk away from that. Yeah. Like, do you feel like, what, do you feel like there was something significant for you or do you feel like you just, you just a wise man? Um, you just, you just got there early. No, then. bro, I, I think, you know, I think, you know, I think this past year, I think everybody's went through something difficult. Everybody's had real, like, serious adversity. Right. And I think, you know, adversity, at the end of the day, if, if you can work through that, it, it brings, like, the best out of you somehow, some way, mm-hmm. if you're doing it in a positive light. Um, but I think, man, like, the, me realizing that, you know, it's just self-reflection, being self, being aware of how I felt. You know, you get tired of feeling like you're just somebody's punching bag or you're getting things that you don't deserve. Like whenever you feel like you're getting something that you don't deserve from somebody, if somebody's saying some, some BS to you and, and disrespecting you and, and then the next day saying, I'm sorry, I still love you. Nah, like if you really like, I always looked at it this way. I feel like, you know, words mean a lot to people and I would never, at least this, I can only, I can only speak for myself, but in, in, in my family, at least with me, dealing with me, I, I've never ever went out of my way to say anything to hurt their feelings. No matter how frustrated I am at them, I'm never ever going to, or it's you, I'm, I'm never ever going to, you know, put somebody else down to bring me up. And there are people who are out here doing that. Yeah. Like, there's vampires out here just sucking people's blood. Like, for real. And, <laughs> and dude, like, right. it's not, and I think, the, 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 the way I got to that point is so what I'm saying is the way that I got to that point is just being self-aware of how I feel mm. being in tune with uh, my emotions to a certain extent um, and how I react and then how, how I reacted to other people too or how I react to my loved ones because you know I'm just I'm just a human I'm not anything else but I still want to give whoever I'm around the love that they deserve because when I'm around somebody, I'm not around anybody that I'm going to hate. I'm not going to be around people that, that are going to tear me down. So I'm going to be cautious of who I let in, but the people that I'm around or if you're around me, I'm just going to give every, give all my love out and just let, let it go. Like, because when I do that, that gives me energy to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but at the same time, it's funny because I think, that is what got to got me to where I am now because I used to give out so much and not get anything back, and we can only do so much. So yeah. What do you? How do you think of love, or maybe I phrase it a little bit different? Like, how do you? How would you see? Because you meet you meet a, you meet the right person. Mm-hmm. Um, you meet a you know a woman that you just you know you fall in love with. All right. What is a what is a healthy relationship? What does that look like to you? I mean that's a pretty big yeah. question, right? But you know I, I guess what I'm getting at is how do you how do you <clears throat> see that and what are some insights that you have on what that looks like? And um, now you're like Dr. Phil, man. Nah, Tell me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. Maybe nah, not hey, Dr. Phil, but hey, you know. Man, I don't even know. Yeah. Um, I think. You know, I think it's about uh, communication um, and understanding where somebody's coming from, mm-hmm. and you know, putting yourself in their shoes, uh, learning, learning their way of life. You know, not everybody lives the same as right. As, not everybody's gonna live the same as you. Like they could grow up totally different. Right. You know, somebody could live live with one parent in their household. I, I grew up with two. My experience could be different. Um, somebody could have two parents that are together all the time. 
my experience could be different. My mom had to be with me. My dad had to be with my brother because we're six years apart and he was taking my brother on trips. So like that experience could be different for me. So the other person's view of a relationship could be different than what my view of a, a marriage is, right? Like a marriage that where my parents did every single thing that they could do. They gave up their dreams, whatever. I don't even know if they gave up their dreams, but whatever they did, they were giving their love, all of their loving to us. And I don't think, you know, everybody believes that. Um, and not saying, and I'm not saying that, that that means it's the right way. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't believe there's any way it's the right way, but um, I think all of, that, all of that is just to say that you gotta look at different perspectives. You gotta try to understand where somebody else is coming from. Mm. And if, I think if, you know, somebody's not willing to do that, to at least try, right? You know, because nobody's perfect. Nobody's gonna do like the the girl who I'm dating or whoever whoever it is. She's not gonna be perfect, but as long as I can see somebody trying and making that effort, then I think that's that's what you want. Because mm. um, it's dude, this isn't a movie. Like you know, we we kind of want things to happen fast, right? We want relationships to happen fast. You want to get there. You want to get to that that lovey dovey stage already, and it's not always there. Mm. Like that's not. That's not real life, you know? Like, as an adult, you start to see different things that you have, and you start to see different things and realize certain things that, you know, especially in my, my life, my career, some people have to adjust. Like, my family had to adjust to how, like, how my brother and I live, you know? I had to adjust to how, to what my brother's career has brought to my family. And whoever I bring into that is gonna have to do the same. And I'm not trying to say that, yo, you have to do this. I'm not saying that. I'm just letting you know by through communication that, yo, this is this is not an easy thing. And I can understand if you're gonna be upset, whatever it may be, uncomfortable, whatever it is, but I need you to express yourself. And I think that's a huge part in relationships with anybody is communicating. So yeah. Yeah, no, well said, man. Understanding, communication. I think and yeah, I think we you kind of nailed it with like seeing somebody like somebody's got to want to see you and vice versa. Bro, and, and like, and you know we can be selfish a lot. You know people are really selfish. Mm. Like, <laughs> you know if you if you keep thinking of somebody negatively, then you're gonna you're gonna at some point you know just lash out and, and say these hurtful things. Or if you keep, if you, if you keep, if you think everything's so bad and where you're at, then you're just gonna project that onto somebody else. Like in relationships, if, if, that, if one person is not good, then the relationship isn't good. Like if you're not doing the best thing for yourself, at that, if I'm not doing the best thing for myself, I'm thinking down on myself, if I'm feeling bad, feeling sorry for myself, looking at life like, oh, whoa, it's me. I'm not treated, I'm not gonna be able to treat the other person the best they can, mm. right? Like yeah. that, that's not, and, and, and the thing is, that person shouldn't have to save me. You know, the only person who's gonna save yourself is yourself. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about that is though, at least for me, I just wanna at least be able to let that person know how I feel, let that person know that, you know, you have love for them. And if that's not the, the right time for somebody's space, then it's just not the right time, and you can't rush that. Like, if somebody's not ready, then they're just not ready. They have to find that on their own. And it sucks because I had to learn it because I went through like, you know, you go through a heartbreak and, you know, it keeps happening, keeps happening. And, and then I had to do stuff for myself. I had to love myself. You gotta love yourself before you can love anybody else. And if you're not loving, and, and when I say love yourself, cause I think some people can get confused and, and think it's, you know, how you look or whatever you wear. No, it's, you know, treating yourself with respect, mm. giving yourself the love that you deserve because you worked your, your, your ass off on Monday through Friday. Give yourself a good weekend to go relax. Enjoy enjoy your time. Because whoever I'm, because after that, when you love yourself, you can just, you know, deal with people in a peaceful manner. And that's, that's I think that's what everybody can deal with if everybody's peaceful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I come back to, I, I've never been able to find the right words. Um, but I think you've, you've nailed it a few times. It's like this idea of, man, like life, Life, it can be hard, mm -hmm. and that's. I don't think that you could have. You could have. You could be a multi-million dollar baseball player. Right. You could be uh, someone on the street. I mean, there are different degrees, mm -hmm. right? But 
but life can be hard yeah. and money will not define our happiness i mean yeah. it creates opportunities right i do believe that yeah Most definitely. but i always find myself thinking man it's like like going back to just this idea of love is that mm-hmm. if we if we if we care about people if we do our best to understand if we mm-hmm. do our best to to understand where they're coming from right and to try to have, uh, I think empathy is probably the right word, mm-hmm. from what it would be like to, to walk in their shoes, right. like, that's such a good place to be. And if we, if more people just did that, yeah. and really did it, mm-hmm. like, like it's one thing just to say it, right? <clears throat> like it's easy to say, oh no, I, I, I feel you. Right. But no, like yeah. you have to really back yourself away mm-hmm. and understand what it would be like. That is, that is such a, a powerful thing for people to be able to share. And it exists. Mm-hmm. Like that's what that's what makes gives me hope. We've right. talked about hope. Yeah. Is people like you that feel that way, and um, that's really powerful, right? right? Because that gives me hope. Yeah. You know that you're 25 years old. I'm 40. Right. We're a different generation, mm-hmm. but we 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 have similar beliefs there, right. and that there's there's a lot of other people out there that right. you know they feel that way, right? Yeah, man. I, I think. It's crazy, you know, because people, just like you're saying, you know, people want to say, I feel you, but they don't, they don't really understand, right? Mm-hmm. I think <clears throat> when you wash everything away, all of that is just fear. Right. You know, people are afraid. Some people are afraid of themselves, and then some people are afraid of what they see on TV. Right. You know, we've been programmed in this world to, to look at things a certain way and to think this is the way it is without even actually being in that situation. Mm. That ain't how life works. Like, I never knew what it was gonna be. I, I never knew what it was gonna feel like to be 25 and not playing in a year and a half. So I couldn't be able. To, like, I wouldn't be able to tell myself this years ago and tell myself how to deal with this to go and to to, to make life easier on myself. No. Right. I think you know people are really just afraid of nothing. <laughs> like everything is unknown. Like I could walk outside this door right now and somebody could be running out the hallway and they could stab me and my life could be done. Mm. Like, I can't, you can't live that way. That's not living life. Like, right. I, I definitely learned that. In my, I think my brother's kind of taught me that. And he's even, he's even, you know, experienced himself, you know, uh, of, of living life and, and not, you know, not, not allowing the stresses and the fears to overcome you. Because, it's, at least for me as a black man, there's a lot to fear about to, in, in, in life sometimes, you know. And, and not even a black man, as a, as a black person, but as a black human being, it's, it's, it's hard or as a person of color, right, to deal with certain things. So I think as long as anybody in this world can, you know, put their fears away, then I think that's the best way we can move forward in life. I think that's the best way you can have empathy because, you know, people always, you know, react off, react out of fear, I feel like. Mm-hmm. When, when, whenever there's a frustration or whenever there's, you know, people talking down or somebody thinking they're better than somebody, it's because of fear, really. Like, you're afraid of what could either happen to you or you losing wherever you're at. Right. And yeah. Oh, um, well, it makes me uh, kind of talk about fear. Cause that's something I think about a lot recently. Mm-hmm. You've always talked about it, but you know, this, this guy, Bruce Lee, yeah. you know, you, you said you're a fan, I'm a right. fan. And, um, uh, one of his quotes and I'm, I'm horrible with exact verbiage. Same. Don't quote you me don't on this, it but it is yeah. something like this. You can mm-hmm. look it up. Right. It's yeah. Um, understanding your fear is the beginning of truly seeing. I think mm. it's something like that. He said that. Wow. Right? And I, I think that's yeah. one of those things that you really have to think about and break down. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds good. Yeah. But if you really think about it, I don't know what he was trying to say, but I'm assuming my assumption would be when we can understand our fears, when we can see them, it, it gives us a really deep understanding of ourselves. Yeah. So unpacking our fears and, and kind of backing up and saying, what, what are we afraid of? Mm. And, and how does that, how does that factored in to our, to our attachments, yeah. to our conditioning? I think that's a really powerful thing because if you can get to a place where you understand your fears and you can move forward and you realize that, you know, I mean, I, other people can hurt you, right? Like mm-hmm. you can physically be hurt, but emotionally, I don't, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe you can get to a place where you realize like, Right. Like, you know, it, 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 you might be sad. Mm-hmm. Like, it sucks. Right. Like, when you're emotionally hurt, 
uh, it's I'm sad. Yeah. But that's different than fear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, no, that's 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 a hundred percent, dude. I I think it's weird. It's weird because I I don't know if I fear too much anymore. Right. Um, but that's powerful, man. Right. I, I think I think I might you know I, I might fear um, situations because I know that because I because I can know the outcome to a certain extent, but I really don't know the outcome. Right. 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 But, but um, I can definitely fear things. But in life, I think, you know, I've learned the best way to live is to live without fear. Like, to, to um, look at others as God's people, as, you know, as God's beings. Like, um, I don't believe that everybody was just born here. I don't think, I don't believe that, you know, there are people who were born bad. I think that everybody was born good and, you know, there are just things in life that, you know, shape them. And this conditioning, the, right. envir- the yeah. environment took shape. Right. right, like, you know, people have different experiences that make them feel a certain way and then you have other things that can be thrown into that and then put on top of that and make you, and change you, really. Right. Um, and change your curiosity, change your innocence. Right. And that's like, I think that's deep. Like, I think that's like a lot of stuff. And you know, what's cool is though, like what I've noticed, especially from leaving from the South is that most people from where I'm from, they don't leave. Like people who like in in my state, like most guys I know from my high school, like they're not leaving Georgia and they don't see the different regions. They don't see the, uh, they don't see the Arizonas. They don't see, uh, California. They don't see the Northwest. They don't see, uh, the Midwest. They don't see the Northeast. So they don't they don't know like they don't they don't feel they don't they don't see other people like yourself having conversations with a black man to a certain extent right and and that's a tough thing to deal with because that just like I don't even know man it's just that's just a tough thing to deal with you know people don't and and it's not saying that it's not anything bad to them right because you know everybody has their own circumstances not everybody can just travel the country not everybody can just travel the right. world well you don't know what you don't know exactly. I mean and that, and I don't mean to cut you off, but oh, I right. but I think what's cool is I find myself when you said that I think like maybe that's what this can do. Mm-hmm. That's part of the idea of of a podcast right. is this opportunity to connect with somebody that's different. I mean we're I, I like personally I mean we're all the same. Mm-hmm. We're all the same foundation. Right. We just happen to be we're just born into different situations, mm-hmm. you know, and our our experiences are different, but we're all the same. Most definitely, but that's what's cool about this is maybe this gets seen and maybe somebody that, you know, maybe a a white man that has never had a black friend, you know, looks at this and be like, dang, this dude's, you know, is this dude sharp? You know, I mean, that, that's what's cool about this. And that's a big, to be honest, that's what I, what I'm trying to do is have conversations and connect. Yeah. That's, 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 that's amazing. Cause I definitely, um, during the quarantine time, you know, I started getting into podcasts more, like listening to guys talk and, and, uh, I know, I remember you used to bring up Joe Rogan all the time. Like, I used to have, like, a perception of Joe Rogan that, like, was, like, just straight negative. Right, yeah. And, like, that was off of my own biases, right? Yeah, yeah. And, then, nah, but, like, I took the time, sat down, saw who he was talking to, listened to what he was talking about. It's like, bro, he's one of the most fair human beings, like, I've ever heard talk. Yeah. Um, And that was just, like, amazing to me. Like, that I could really think that way about Joe Rogan without knowing that man, mm-hmm. without listening to any of his podcasts, without listening to five minutes of his podcast yeah well man we live in this time where i think it's one of the hardest the biggest hurdles for us to overcome is this um uh noise of information right and that's a good example and to me that okay you what you did what's right you Mm -hmm. well you uh, that's how i would look at it right you were able to accept your bias Mm -hmm. you were able to accept the lens that you see the world through is uh, is filtered a certain way, mm-hmm. not right or wrong, right. but you're going to try to view it for yourself and then make and make a, a decision. Mm-hmm. And that's such a good example of something that, like, if you were, that's just human nature. Mm-hmm. Like, we're we're going to be, uh, our opinions are going to be biased based off of where we are, who right. we're around. Hundred percent. It happens every. It happens 100%. all over. <laughs> and with social media, media, it's that much harder. Yeah. So I don't. I don't have the answer there because I think, unfortunately, like even even really unbiased sources are still yeah. biased. Yeah, for sure. Outside of just keeping an open mind and understanding 
understanding that. I think that's a huge first step. And I think, you know, too, like, I, at least I want to say this. I, I, I don't want, you know, I, I wish people would just, like, understand that, too, though. Yeah. You know, truly understand that, you know, this person over here, you know, this, it could be this racist person over here is God's human being, right? Mm-hmm. And it's tough to say, right? Because I don't try to hate anybody. But I don't like stuff like that. And for for me to understand that he's a product, he's that person is a product of their environment. Mm-hmm. Just like a black kid in the inner city is a product of his, of his environment. And they don't they don't equate, right? They're not they're not they're not equal into into where we're coming from. I think in terms of like how we approach them and how we look at them and, and what kind of, how much information, how much love you give them. I, I don't believe that, no, right? But I think if more people thought that way, then I think it would just, it would just be better off. Like, if that you can really, you know, think of that person as, as another human being that, that is just a product of where they come from. And if they don't want to get out of it, then that's just sad because that is not life. That's not living. Yeah. Like we're saying, like, that's all fear. Like, you're not trying to deal with certain things that, um, you're not trying to deal with the world that God has created. And that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But it's tough, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, I think uh, trauma, trauma, fear, oh man, it, it, it gets deep. Right. It goes deep. Yeah. I, I, I recently had this kind of epiphany of, uh, of like an understanding. I haven't been able to really put it into words, but that like, Every experience we go through as a human gets stored. Mm. And I think the negative ones, the, the traumatic ones, we, we talked yeah. about this, right? It gets stored deep. Yeah. And that plays into our biases. It plays into how we see the world. It mm-hmm. plays into the lens that right. we see the world. And to me, the good ones probably get stored too, but they probably get stored yeah. different. Mm-hmm. You know, we're more like, we want to remember the good ones. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, I had a... I was having a conversation with somebody about this. My parents got divorced when I was young. Mm. And in a lot of ways, it was good. Mm. Um, you know, I have a really cool family, you know, different, you know, different parents and right. whatnot. But I don't have memories of my mom and my dad being together. Mm. So I, ha- I, I literally I never really thought about this. And I was like, I have to have blocked those out. Right. They're, they're somewhere down. I've stored them somewhere mm-hmm. that I... I'm, I'm a, I don't know if it has affected me negatively or positively yet. I don't know if I need to dive into that at all. I just know they're in there. And it's interesting that I don't remember. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think that's to me going back to Bruce Lee is understanding our fear is our, our sadness, our fear, all of these memories, these traumatic experiences that shaped us. If we can understand them and unravel them, mm-hmm. we can move to this place where we can truly exist. Because you tell me as an athlete, I'm not an athlete. I mean, I am. I think, yeah, but, but, I, but I'm, like, about, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting paid to yeah, play a sport. Sure, if yeah. you can, if you can perform from a place um, of 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 not fear mm. and just just be, just exist, I think yeah. that's probably pretty powerful. I know fear can propel us forward, and there there probably are scientists that understand that better than me. Right. Like fear can probably be a pretty powerful driver, mm-hmm. but I think if it is like if you understand that you're you're afraid, you have fear of not making it, mm-hmm. or of not being successful, or of not, um, you know, getting the contract or whatever it is, and you can see that, and you say, well, what is that? It's probably a little kid mm-hmm. that at some point made a made a connection or had a, a, a an attachment to these to having things and making it. Mm. And we're stuck there. If we can see that and move, and now you can just operate, I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it, it definitely makes sense. I, I feel like at least, you know, I look at, I think that's, you know, I think that's why, at least for me as a kid, like I had so much fun because I didn't, I wasn't fear, I wasn't afraid of anything yeah. playing, playing the game. Right. You know, um, but now that there are consequences out there, right? Um, about your job security, right. then there there are fears that that you kind of throw out there to yourself that you don't even sometimes realize, right? Like if I'm in a, if I'm in a certain count, like 
and I'm, and I'm, and I'm uh, up to bat, like I, I don't, I'm fearful. You can be fearful of striking out. Right. And you know, the more fearful you get, that's usually when you strike out. Right. Um, but I would say to that, like the more times that that you're you're diving into to going out there to get a hit, like the more I'm diving in, telling myself, yo, I'm going, I'm out here to hit. I'm out here to to to, to be aggressive and hit the baseball, put the ball in play. Then my instincts just take over somehow, some way, right? Yeah, you're not afraid of you're not afraid of striking out. You're, yeah, you're you're looking at it completely different. And 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 it's like it's like a parent or like a like an adult telling a kid, hey, just play the game, have fun, play the game, just play the game, play the game. Yeah. And that's it. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. You know, that you're thinking about besides playing that game that day and giving it your best. And I guess. For me to say that, that's baseball is such a mental sport. Like mm-hmm. it's such a long season for us. We have we have a hundred in the minor leagues. You had 141 of the, 42 of these games where you could fail like, 90 to 100 times. Yeah. And you have to keep coming back the the, the next day and and dealing with it and or go, going back home that night <laughs> and either reflecting on it or moving forward the next day and that's that's a tough thing mm-hmm. to just keep getting knocked down and having to come back and and you know show your face and i think that's where um pride and not pride in a negative sense um but but being proud of proud of yourself in the little things you know be proud that you came back to work that day mm-hmm. be proud that you're out here representing your family i think that's i think being proud is is something that needs to be put out there more, especially for kids. You know, like they need to be proud of themselves. They need to be proud that they that they um, that they got a C in a class that was extremely hard for them. But be proud to motivate yourself to keep going and get better. Right. Because we always want to grow. Right, right. Yeah. That's it, man. Well, growth, growth, the growth mindset is in is looking at it from a standpoint exactly. You nailed it. Is being being proud of your effort Mm -hmm. and your effort might not always equate to your to the outcome right you know you can do you can show up with the right mindset and you can believe in yourself and you can do all the right things and you can strike out Mm -hmm. but you can be proud that you approached it the right way right or that you that you did what you did and Mm -hmm. i think that's a growth mindset i think that's a big piece is that in most sports your the outcome is not directly correlated with i mean you could you could smoke a line drive to mm-hmm. the center fielder you know you hit a ball perfect you could get four hits and lose you know there's mm-hmm. a lot of like these random situations right. that i think it's important to teach kids that um to be to be proud of their effort mm-hmm. how hard are they trying right. and are they committed to growing to right. just keep getting better right. so i think that's a big piece of being happy in life is finding Finding some love in, uh, in competing and growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's dope. We're at okay. Well, I feel like yeah, I feel like we need a part two, man. <laughs> That'd be dope. I mean, I'm not for um, yeah. yeah, man. I, I, you know, I appreciate the connection and your insight. Yeah. And uh, like I told you before, man, I learned a lot. So I'm, I'm excited. You know, I'm excited to to watch you grow because right. I know whatever you do, whether that's baseball coach mm. whatever you're yeah. gonna you'll be successful um and you're gonna and i've told you this i think you know i believe you're gonna you're gonna change people's lives and that's that's what matters man mm-hmm. you know and, yeah. and whether that's in baseball or that's something else right. so but um i do have like one question for you because mm. i i figured this would be like you know we got to get the we got to get uh draw people in okay so this would be our little thing right. so you and your brother mm-hmm. who wins in an arm wrestling contest Bro, arm wrestling. Oh, bro, that's that's deep. That's deep. Uh, yes, come on, you know, bro. I'm, I mean, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm winning, bro. I'm there not. You go. I'm not. I'm not saying anything but me winning. He's a little bigger than you, though. He, he got the height. <laughs> he got the height. He's, six, he's like six six, but he's yeah. But he right. ain't, he ain't as fresh. He ain't as fresh. Go. This will mm-hmm. put our we'll put our little social media clip so people will be curious yeah. about who wins. But really, <laughs> sure. the podcast has nothing to do with that. Right. Exactly. But, sure. Um. For. I mean, are you interested in people finding you? I know you, you know, some up, you know, private with your stuff, but do you want people to, uh, you know, check out your social media? Um, I mean, I mean, 
if they want to, I feel like you know, if they want to find me, they'll find me. Yes, they want to. That's connect. how I'm, that's how I leave it. You know, if yeah. they find if they find me through your your account, then they find me through your account. If yeah. they want to find me, they find me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. Appreciate you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Yep.